Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Kola. Here, the god of Mormonism and his wives through endless celestial sex produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there, Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth, where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus, who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. The spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter-skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the starbase Kola, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary, in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians, who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 AD, the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. 1,400 years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing sacred temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim. 
Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. The Mormons thank God for Joseph Smith, who claimed that he had done more for us than any other man, including Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe that he died as a martyr, shed his blood for us, so that we too, may become gods. And in Romans 16, 17, we find a principle as to why sermons like these are, are important to preach. Romans 16, 17 says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. The Bible says that we are to mark them. Now, mark means to identify. Mark means to, you know, call them out so that people know who you're talking about and avoid them for they are for they that are such serve not our lord jesus christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple the bible says for many deceivers are entered into the world and the bible's warning us that there are many many people out there whose goal is to deceive us and whose goal is to deceive everyone and they preach another gospel they preach a false gospel the Book of Mormon teaches another gospel and it says that it is another testament. The thing is that Joseph Smith received it from an angel in heaven called Moroni. Now it's a strange thing because Galatians chapter 1 clearly tells us that if someone is coming to you with another gospel, then we need to be aware of them. They need to be accursed according to the Bible. It says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So the Bible is saying hey, these people need to be accursed that will bring another gospel. It also says it again in verse 9, just to make sure that he's being clear. It says in verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. What do you believe that someone has to do to get to heaven? Oh, they've got to do lots of things, I suppose. But the first, the first step is to have faith. Mm -hmm. They need to be baptized and they basically need to lead a good life. And so it's pretty much like faith plus works, you know, that we get into heaven. Yes, yeah, it's not a, you don't just get a free ticket by doing one thing, it's, it's all the things that you do. There are many things that we need to do, like living a good life and um, spending our days in, in the service of God, but there are a few key things that we believe in our church that you need to do um, to be able to live with God again. Um, first is to be baptised. Um, as a member of the Church um, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by someone holding um, God's authority to perform that baptism. The second is to repent of um, your, your wrongdoings. The last thing and the most important thing that we think um, you need to do to return to God is to, to endure to the end, to keep being a good person and to keep the promises that you make to God when you're baptised. And then once the resurrection occurs, the Lord will then judge us based on our hearts and our actions on earth. So Mormons understand that we do differentiate from mainstream Christianity in this way, and that Mormons believe we are saved through the grace of Jesus Christ after all that we can do. But that did not matter to Jesus. His gospel is for all who will forsake their old ways and make the changes they need to be saved in the kingdom of God. Zacchaeus of Jericho and Stanley of Hawaii 
stand for all of us. They are examples of what we pray will be experienced by all of us who decide to receive the Lord joyfully and follow where he leads. The gospel of Jesus Christ challenges us to change. Repent is its most frequent message, and repenting means giving up all of our practices, personal, family, ethnic, and national, that are contrary to the commandments of God. The purpose of the gospel is to transform common creatures into celestial citizens, and that requires change. There is a unique gospel culture, a set of values and expectations and practices common to all members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This gospel way of life comes from the plan of salvation, the commandments of God and the teachings of the living prophets. It is given expression in the way we raise our families and live our individual lives. The principles stated in the family proclamation are a beautiful expression of our gospel culture. All who have belonged to these cultures of sin must repent and change if they are to become the people of God. I testify that this is what our Lord and Savior would have us do so that we may become what his gospel intends us to be. Because gospel means good news. This ain't good news. How could good news be that you have to repent of all your sins to be saved? That's not the good news. The good news is that you don't have to repent of all your sins to be saved and that Jesus paid for all your sins on the cross, was buried, and then he rose again from the dead. If you had to repent of all your sins to be saved, guess what? I would not be saved and neither would you because none of us are perfect. None of us can change all our life and, and, and do works to be saved. That's another gospel. That's another testament. And that is not what the Bible teaches at all. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So he's saying right there that Abraham was not justified by works. If he had been justified by works, he would have had something to boast about or brag about or something whereof to glory, but not before God. He could have gloried to his fellow man, but that kind of glorying isn't going to hold up in God's eyes. Why? Because God is so much greater and holier than any of us. We can't glory to him about our own works. So it says here that if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So that right there states that the person who does not do works but believes on Christ is justified by his faith because his faith is counted for righteousness. They'll teach that you can't go to heaven without works. That's a lie because the Bible says right here that to him that worketh not but believeth, it says that he's saved. His faith is counted for righteousness. He's justified. So this idea that says, well, faith is always accompanied by works is a fraud because Romans 4, 5 talks about a guy who has the faith, but he doesn't have the works. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Notice he says, no works, it's without works. Him that worketh not. But thanks be to God, Jesus Christ took all of our sins upon him. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So all of Christ's righteousness is imputed unto us and all of our sins were imputed unto Christ and he took our punishment for us as a substitute on the cross. This is the gospel, this is basic. And God saw their works, notice that they turn from their evil way. So here's what the Bible says. When someone turns from their evil ways, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But here's what I want you to understand. God considers that works. God saw their 
works that they turn from their evil way. And let me give you an example of what I just said. Notice, and God repented. You see that? And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Because God said he was going to destroy Nineveh, but when he saw that they turned from their evil way, and they repented, and he saw that work that they did, then God repented and said, I was going to destroy you, now I'm not going to destroy you. So there's an example of God repenting. And here's what I want you to say. Not only does repent, the word repent not mean just by default that you must repent, is referring to sin, because we see here that God repented, but God defines turning from your evil way as works. So if you say, well, yeah, you got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But you can't just keep living your life the way you know you want to. And you've got to turn from certain things and you got to quit doing certain things, uh, you know, or else you're not saved. You know, here's the problem with that. God would call that works. That right there says that when you turn from your evil way, that's your works. So if you believe that a person has to turn from their evil way and believe on Christ, here's what you're saying, they have to believe on Christ and have works. And you know what? The Bible says salvation is without works. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Jonah 3.10 says turning from your sins or turning from your evil way is works. So that's why this is such an important doctrine. You see, the devil wants to get you to trust your works to save you. All the way back to Cain and Abel, he's trusting his works instead of the blood of the Lamb. All the way back to the Tower of Babel, they're trying to do their works to get them to heaven. All throughout Galatians, he warns us, it's a false gospel when you think that you're justified by works. All throughout Romans, he tells us we're not justified by works. I mean, he warns us, look, trust Christ for salvation. Don't trust works. But look at Matthew 7, 21. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And I'm going to show you in just a moment what the will of the Father is. But look what he says next. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So this right here shows that the people who are going to be damned on Judgment Day, who think they're saved but really aren't, are not people who lost their salvation. That's not possible. It's people who are trusting in, what's the last word of verse 22? Works. works. The people who are trusting in their works, Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Not I used to know you because you can't lose it. They never had it in the first place. Now look, if you were to stand before God right now and God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? Would you say I've done many wonderful works? No. Absolutely not. No Bible-believing Christian, no one who understands that salvation is by grace through faith would ever say to God, but God, how can you not be letting me in when I've done so many wonderful works? The only person who would say such a thing is one who thinks that their works have something to do with getting them into heaven. Look, I mean, look what they're listing. We've prophesied here today. We've done preaching. We've done wonderful works. We've cast out devils in your name. Look, are these people claiming the name of Jesus? Have they called Jesus Lord? Are they doing a lot of wonderful works in Jesus' name? So why in the world are they cast out? Why are they not allowed into heaven? Because anyone who is trusting in their works is not saved. The Bible says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Boasting like what? Boasting like, I've done many wonderful works? No, no flesh shall glory in his presence. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We have nothing to boast of. Our salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible is teaching us crystal clear in this passage that if you go to hell, he never knew you. And if you're trusting in works, even if you're saying, I believe in Jesus, I'm doing it in the name of Jesus, but you say, well, I'm going to heaven because of my works, you're not saved. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Now let's look at the will of the Father. Because a lot of people will get confused. They'll see the will of the Father in verse 21 and say, see, you have to do the works. 
Well, these people did the works. But go to John chapter 6. Let's see what the will of the Father is. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Now watch another aspect of the Father's will in verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So what's the will of the Father? That people will see the Lord Jesus Christ, believe on him, and be raised up at the last day. And so the Mormons teach that there's different kingdoms in heaven and different, like, I guess, levels of heaven. After they die, is there, like, different levels of heaven? Or because what if someone doesn't do all the stuff? Okay, well, after we, after we die, we, we, we go to certain areas. And instead of just going to a heaven or a hell, which feels a little black and white to Mormons, um, Mormons actually believe that there are three different kingdoms that you can go to once the judgment has occurred. Uh, the top kingdom is the celestial kingdom, which has unimaginable glory. The middle kingdom is the terrestrial kingdom, which has some glory. And then the bottom kingdom is the telestial kingdom, which has uh, less glory. Have a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is where they get it from and verse number 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so there you have it, guys. You know, there's three different kingdoms of heaven. But where do they get that from? You know, because they, they call it the celestial kingdom, there's a terrestrial kingdom, and there's some other kingdom as well that they believe. But there's only two mentioned here, but they're not even kingdoms. It's just talking about bodies, and there's a star, and the moon, and the stars, and they all differ one from another. And it's talking about our body, we've got the flesh, but when we get risen again at the rapture, we're going to obviously have a spiritual body and it's going to differ from the body we've got right now, but it's not talking about different levels in heaven. But if you really want to get to the top kingdom, then you're going to have to be a Mormon. You're going to have to be married in the, in the temple. You're going to have to wear their strange underwear and everything else to go that, to get to the top kingdom. Now, the only people they teach will actually go to outer darkness, which they call hell, or outer darkness is sort of like the Jehovah's Witness soul sleep. They don't really believe they're going to burn in fire forever, but the only people going there are uh, ex-Mormons that leave the church. And the Mormons, they will try to teach you that everybody pretty much goes to heaven. Okay, so you believe that even people that don't hear about Jesus, that they can still be saved? Yes, def most definitely. They believe like the lower two kingdoms of heaven, that you can make it there without Jesus Christ at all. You know, you can just be a good person, you can be a Hindu, a Muslim, you'll make it to that, those lower kingdoms without Jesus Christ. When the Bible teaches that there's only one way to heaven, there's only one heaven, and there's a hell, and to get it to heaven, there's only one way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so there's only one way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus taught there's a heaven, there's a hell. There's no middle ground. There's no purgatory like the Catholics believe. There's no, you know, two lower kingdoms of heaven like the Mormons believe. There's heaven, there's hell, and if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to be burning in the pits of hell forever. That's it. That's the only options. One of the main things that the Mormons teach is that their Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. And so it says on the Book of Mormon that is another testament, right? Yes, yeah, another testament. But yeah. It talks to the same things. Um, from, a different, from a different group of people. Well, the funny thing is, we don't need another testament because Jesus Christ, he shed his blood for the New Testament. Now they claim that he, Joseph Smith, shed his blood for the Book of Mormon, just like Jesus did for the New Testament. Listen to this. 
this is in the, their doctrine and covenants, which they believe is scripture. It says in chapter number 135 in verse 1, to seal the testimony of this book, it's talking about the Doctrine and Covenants and the Book of Mormon, we announce the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, the prophet. Joseph Smith and his brother, they're trying to escape and his brother was shot dead. And then Joseph Smith jumped out of the window and you know, they shot him while he was falling, good shot. And then they also shot them when they were dead. And so that's how they died, right? Now jump down to verse number 28. It says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And, and look in Hebrews chapter 10 now, in verse number 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Notice it says once for all. Maybe you underline that in the Bible, once for all. We don't need Joseph Smith to die for any other New Testament or another Testament or his Book of Mormon or the Doctrine of Covenants or the Pearl of Great Price. We don't need that. It says once for all. Because he was the Lamb of God that shed his blood for the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And their book is not another Testament of Jesus Christ. It's the Testament of Joseph Smith who shed his blood for this corrupt book of Mormon. It's a corrupt book. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does not contain the gospel. It claims to say this is the, the gospel, the everlasting gospel of Jesus, yet it changes the gospel. It changes into a workplace salvation. The Book of Mormon teaches that there's thousands of gods, yea, trillions of gods, and that you can become your own god on your own planet. Now, the Bible never teaches that at all. They say that there's one god, and that's it. So, so Heavenly Father used to be a man like, a sinful man like us? Yes, yes. And, um, like, Heavenly Father used to be, like, the same as us before on a previous planet? Right. Yeah, so that um, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, two separate beings and people um, that were made in their image. So at some point, uh, we do believe that they existed um, as, as we do as well. Mm -hmm. And listen to this, Orson Pratt. The gods who dwell in the heaven have been redeemed from the grave in a world which existed before the foundation of this earth were laid. They and the heavenly body they now inhabit were once in a fallen state. Uh, this is basically teaching that God used to be a, a sinful guy who became a god. He was in another world, on another planet. And they were exalted also from fallen men to celestial gods, plural, to inhabit their heaven forever and ever. Uh, we were begotten by our Father in heaven. The, I mean, what, what? I can't even read this garbage. Nonsense. In the same article, Becoming Like God, Becoming Like God, they said this. And again, this is from their own website, LDS.org. Here's what they said. Human nature was at its core divine. God was once as one of us. Lorenzo Snow, the church's fifth president, coined a well-known couplet. He said this, as man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. All human beings are children of loving heavenly parents and possess seeds of divinity within them. Joseph Smith said this, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and since enthroned in yonder heavens, that is the great secret. Joseph Smith also said this. He said, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. And you know what, Joseph Smith? God was God from all eternity. The Bible says that he is the beginning and the end. The Bible, he is the I am. He is the self-existing one. He has always existed. He, he has no beginning. He has no end. But the Mormon church teaches, no, you know what? God was once a man that got exalted to Godhood. And one day you and I can even be exalted to Godhood. That is heresy. That is a lie. You're 
become a god, right, in the in the next life? It depends how you how you um, keep the commandment. You mm. see. And so, do you believe that you can become a god in the next? You know, like have your own like gospel that you can preach to another you know planet later on in the future. Most definitely will. Yeah, we will. So we we can become as gods. We God has promised us that. Um, that we, if we adhere to his commandments and if we're obedient, that we can become like he is as gods and princes and, and princesses and kings and queens in his kingdom if we do all the things that he's asked us to do in the scriptures mm. and through his prophets. So then there would be thousands of gods then, right? Yeah, for yeah. sure. And we'd be creating our own worlds and, and doing many marvelous things um, on the other side. Right. In Isaiah chapter 14, Satan says that he will be like the Most High. He will be like God. And the Mormons think that they will become a God. Well, they're following Satan in his footsteps. Just like he tried to make Eve believe that she could become a God in Genesis chapter number 3. Because this doctrine of man one day being exalted to the place of God comes from none other than Satan himself. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, I'll just give you one example of this. We could go to other passages and look at it, but I'll just give you one example. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1 says this, Now the serpent, who's the serpent? It's Satan. The Bible is very clear about that. He's the serpent, the great dragon. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Notice verse 5. For God doth know, this is Satan speaking, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, all the way from the Garden of Eden, Satan was teaching that, hey, you could be like God. You could be a god. He was telling Eve, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, ye shall be as gods. And, and that, that doctrine is the same doctrine that the Latter-day Saints, this is why you know, we call them the Latter-day Satanists teach. Why? Because it's a satanic doctrine that teaches that man can become like God. You know, I, I envision when I read this story, I envision that the serpent showed up, you know, with a short sleeve white shirt and a little, a little sign on, on his chest that says, you know, Elder Serpent. And he says, hey, ye shall be as gods. Because that's what they're selling you. That's what the Mormon church is teaching today. They are teaching that you can become like God. Look at Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, who's Lucifer? He's talking about Satan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Hear me now. He did not say that he wanted to replace God. That's what you'll commonly hear preached. He wanted to replace God. Is that what it says in the passage? No, he said, I will also sit in the sides of the earth. You see how many times also is used? He said in verse 13, I will exalt my throne above the sides of the north. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He said, I will ascend above the highest mountain. I will be like the most high. He didn't say I'm going to replace the most high. But he said, I'll be a God too. I'll be like him. I will also be in the position that he is now in. But what's the result? Verse 15. God is telling Lucifer, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. And when the Mormons talk about Jesus, they're not talking about the Jesus of the Bible. Oh, no. The Jesus of the Bible has been given a name that is above any other name. 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things other the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the Jesus of the Bible is the Savior of the world, the only begotten of the Father, God in the flesh. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.8, but unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So Jesus is not God? Um, no. Look, if you would, at Mark chapter 10, verse number 17. The Bible reads, And when one was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him, and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Let me ask you something. Is it possible for Jesus to be just a good teacher if he's not God? No way. Why? Because there's only one that's good, and that's God. Either Jesus here is either saying, in verse 17 and 18, he's either saying one of two things. Jesus is either saying, I'm not good, and I'm not God, or he is saying, I am good, and I'm God. I mean, that's the only way. How else can you interpret that? He says, why are you calling me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. If Jesus Christ is not God, then he's not good. And what kind of a blasphemous thing would it be to say Jesus isn't good? He's the good shepherd. He's good. In fact, he, he was perfect. In fact, he was God. You see, the Jesus of the Bible is God incarnate, God in the flesh. The Jesus of Mormonism is a God. Not the God, not the one true only God, but a God of many. Yeah, inf infinite. Infinite gods, yeah, for sure. Um, we do believe that there are, there are many gods and there are many high, higher beings. Here's what Brigham Young said. This is a verbatim quote. How many gods there are? He said, I don't know. But there was never a time when there were not gods and worlds and when men were not passing through the same ordeals that we are passing through. So did you hear that? Gods and worlds. And I don't know how many there are. Listen to this. This is another Mormon apostle that came later on, Orson Pratt. Here's what he said. If we should take a million of worlds like this and number their particles, we should find that there are more gods than there are particles of matter in those worlds. Whoa, man, that's a lot of gods. I mean, even a Hindu would probably, this would, this would floor them. I mean, if we take a million worlds and count up all the particles, I mean, is he talking subatomic? Or are we just talking molecules? Or what are we talking, Orson? Help us out here. He's saying that there are literally like a bazillion gods. I mean, he's saying like a number like 10 to the whatever power. I mean, you have to, you have to use scientific notation to count how many gods the, the Mormons believe in. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Do you see that? He said, there was no God before me. There will never be any God after me. I am he, there's none else, and beside me there is no Savior. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not a different Savior. He's God manifest in the flesh. And so the Bible's real clear again and again that there's only one God. And just in case you were confused, God even says, let me just break this down to you. Before me, there was no other God. And after me, there's never going to be another God. It's just a bunch of garbage. It's like, oh, there's all these other planets and other galaxies and other gods. Oh, it's like, this is not Christianity, my friend. Quit saying, it. oh, this is another, he believes in Jesus. He don't even believe that there's one God. He's not even a monotheistic.
Did you know that the Book of Mormon is a racist book and it teaches the more dark your skin is that the more sinful you were in your previous life. Yet we didn't even have a previous life, but that's what they believe. They teach that the more dark skin, the more sinful you are. Most religions believe in some sort of life after death, but Mormons also teach that before we were born, we all had previous lives where we lived as spirits on a heavenly world with their father, a glorified man named Elohim. Jehovah, who would be born on earth as Jesus, laid out his plan designed to bring the Father glory. On contrast, Lucifer's plan was crafted to bring himself glory. A war broke out in heaven to decide the best path to Godhood. Some fought valiantly for Jehovah, some sided with Lucifer. Others remained partially neutral. Eventually, Jehovah's plan won the day. Lucifer became the devil and was banished to earth along with his followers who would become his demons. Be gone, rebel. Satan, be gone. The spirits who did not fight valiantly for Jesus were still allowed to participate in his plan to become human, but as punishment, they were to be born to a cursed line of descendants. The curse began on earth when Cain, the son of Adam, killed his brother Abel. After the murder, according to the historical claims of Mormonism, Cain was cursed with a black skin as punishment, a curse that would be passed down to all of his descendants. Joseph Fielding Smith stated, Because of Cain's wickedness, he became the father of an inferior race. The mark which was placed on Cain and which his posterity inherited was the black skin. Second prophet of the Mormon church, Brigham Young, had similar unsavory things to say regarding these supposed descendants of Cain. Some classes of the human family are black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their habits, wild, and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of the intelligence that is generally bestowed upon mankind. The first man who committed the odious crime of killing one of his brethren would be cursed. The Lord put a mark upon Cain, which is the flat nose and black skin. Not only was it taught that dark skin was a curse, Young also taught that slavery was included as part of that curse. At least one woman we know of was meant to be forever bound to eternal servitude in the afterlife. This was the African-American Mormon woman, Jane Elizabeth Manning James. In 1894, she took part in a special ceremony prepared for her, which was meant to guarantee her spot as servant of the Mormon founder, Joseph Smith, for all of eternity. Shall I tell you the law of God in regards to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. Mormon prophet George Albert Smith said, Intermarriage of the Negro and White Races, a concept which has heretofore been most repugnant to most normal-minded people. There is a growing tendency toward the breaking down of race barriers in the matter of intermarriage between whites and blacks, but it does not have the sanction of the church and is contrary to church doctrine. We must not intermarry with the Negro. Why? If I were to marry a Negro woman and have children by her, my children would be cursed. If there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, they receive the curse. Cain was cursed with a dark skin. He became the father of the Negroes, and those spirits who are not worthy to receive the priesthood are brought through his lineage. Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Under no circumstances can they hold this authority from the Almighty. The gospel message of salvation is not carried affirmatively to them. 
Negroes are not equal with other races where the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned. Second LDS President Brigham Young expounded upon the Book of Mormon teaching in this 1859 statement referring to Native Americans. You may inquire of the intelligent of the world whether they can tell why the aborigines of this country are dark, loathsome, ignorant, and sunken into the depths of degradation. When the Lord has a people, he makes covenants with them and gives unto them promises. Then, if they transgress his law and break his covenants, he will put a mark upon them, as in the case of the Lamanites. So what is it teaching? It's teaching racism. It's teaching that it's better to be a white person. The Bible never teaches that. It never teaches that it's better to be white or it's better to be black or better to be Asian or anything. It doesn't matter what race we're from, the Bible teaches. But the Book of Mormon teaches racism. Because I was just reading this verse in Jacob 3.8. It says, Oh my brethren, I fear, unless ye shall repent of your sins, that their skins will be whiter than yours when you shall be brought with them before the throne of God. I just found that that was quite racist, you know, saying that unless you repent of your sins, that their skins are going to be whiter. That's yeah. the word of God. It's, oh. it's not the it's not word of man. It's not word by man. That's yeah. the word of God. I was just reading it and it says in 2 Nephi chapter 5, verse 21, and he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity, for behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto flint. Wherefore, as they were white, and exceed in fear and delights him, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. So it's teaching that, you know, in your past life, it, like if you're, the browner your skin is, the more sinful you were sort of in the past life. At one stage, the Lamanites, which were the, the baddies, if you want to put it that way, they were given, they were given a curse and a mark. Uh, and the mark was the color of the skin. Because the Book of Mormon is a racist book that teaches that the whiter you are, the more godly you are. And it even talks about, in the Book of Mormon, people, when they start getting right with God, they kept getting whiter. And then other people, when they sinned against God, they got darker and darker. I mean, that is what is taught in the Book of Mormon, folks. And as people these days, as they keep commandments, I've, I've, in my lifetime, I've seen American Indians who have become Mormons, if you like, and, and lived the commandments, and their, their skin over their lifetime has actually lightened. Wow. You know, without, without, you know, going from black to white in one day or red to white. Yeah, but gradually just gra yeah. get whiter and whiter. Not because right? they haven't been outside either, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the book of 3rd Nephi, in the book of Moron, it says in verse number 14, And it came to pass that those Lamanites who had united with the Nephites were numbered among the Nephites, and their curse was taken from them, and their skin became white like unto the Nephites. And their young men and their daughters became exceeding fair, and they were numbered among the Nephites, and were called Nephites, and thus ended the 13th year. So it says that these people, that they got right, and it says their skin became white like unto the Nephites, and their curse disappeared. There's a curse that came upon people, yeah. and they were white, but God put a curse upon them, and their skin get, became blackness. Yeah. yeah. So what's that talking about, do you know? Um, the layman had other ideas, and he, um, was against God and didn't believe in him. And so he took his family and went off into um, another part of, of the land that they had been promised. And so from that point on, um, thus began the war between, uh, the, the ongoing war between the Lamanites and the Nephites. Um, even after Laman and Nephi died, their families and their pros prosperity um, kept fighting. Um, and so um, God put a cursing upon the Lamanites um, because of their wickedness. It was a mark mm -hmm. um, to, to, I guess, spot the difference um, between the righteous and the wicked. Um, but at that time that you were just reading from, um, the, Lam the Lamanites were 
a wicked people and that's why God cursed them mm. and um, I guess yeah the, the curse and the mark that they were given was a, a blackness and that's what we believe that's where we believe the um, American the Native American Indians originated yeah right. so you know that that mark of Cain or that you know the blackness of skin would that not be teaching racism then that mm -hmm. like that darker skinned people were more more sinful than white people? Um, at the time. I mean, I don't think racism even existed back then. I, I just think it was a pure um, wickedness versus righteousness. Um, but yeah, definitely there was a difference um, in skin color and there was an association with um, the darkness of skin being evil um, and the lightness of skin being pure. Um, I mean, anyone can take that how they would like. It does if if you haven't read the Book of Mormon, or, or if you're um, if you're kind of just taking it as as a, at a glimpse, um, it would appear that way. Definitely racism. Because yeah. I know Brigham Young. I had read a quote from him, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, because I know black people were not allowed to join, you know, become a priest until the 1970s, yeah, right? Sure. And Brigham Young actually said that you know that darker skinned people cannot mingle with the church mm -hmm. now i've got it written down do you want to see it no yeah no, i believe yeah it, yeah yeah, yeah I, I don't know it just se it seems like there's a lot of does, yeah. does that offend you or as a yeah no for sh not at all it's um yeah i i definitely acknowledge that and honestly um when i found that out uh when I was a teenager, um, when I came to understand it more, black, black people weren't allowed to participate in, you know, some church things and in priesthood activity. Um, up until not even that long ago, you know, I questioned why, mm. you know, and it was a question that not just something that I asked out loud to my church leaders or to my parents, but something that I had to ask God about. And so we don't claim, I don't think anyone in this church, even the prophet himself claims to know why God um, didn't allow black people to participate in some um, church activities and and have the priesthood. And I opened it up, and it said that if you rebel against God, you're gonna your skin's gonna get darker, and and that you know that if you're living for God, you're gonna be white, and that white people are better. I mean, that's what the Mormonism teaches, and they still believe that book to this day. And it's funny that, you know, a lot of the people that we're door knocking around here, they're Mormons. And what color skin do they have? They're not white, because most of them are islanders. Most of them are maybe from New Zealand and the, the Maldives. And they are not white. They are brown skinned people. And their own book that they read is telling them that they are more sinful than white people because of the color of their skin. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we all come from one blood. It doesn't matter what color skin we have. And you know what I think about the Super Book of Mormon? You know what I think? This, this book should just be ripped in half. You know, when you just throw that thing away, it's a piece of junk. That's what the Book of Mormon is. It's worthless. It should be in the trash, just like the Catholic Bible, just like the Quran, just like all the other Bibles. The Book of Mormon is not the true word of God and should be in the trash with the rest of them. There's only one Bible and it's called the King James Bible. We are all of one blood. We are all his children through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. We don't believe that there should be a different church for different nationality. And the Mormon church said whites only for a long time. He said, God is not a respecter of persons and you will be cut down and uprooted if you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And anyone, red, yellow, black, and white, who believes on Christ is one of his chosen people. You are the chosen one. You are the holy nation. You are the peculiar people if you believe on Christ. He's the God of all flesh. He's the God of all the earth. And the Bible says when we get to heaven in Revelation 7, there will be people there of every nation, every tribe, every language, every kindred, and every tongue will be represented in heaven. It's not an elite group for a certain uh, family. It's, it's, it's open to everybody. Whosoever will, let them take the water of life freely. But, you know, listen to me very carefully. Any belief system that has its roots in racism needs to be rejected, period.
So here I am outside the Freemason Temple in Brisbane. Freemasonry and Mormonism have a lot in common. They're both secret societies. They both worship the same God, Lucifer. They have a lot of symbolism that's the same, like this compass outside this temple. Joseph Smith was a Freemason and he had started a lodge in the early 1800s in Illinois. His father was a Freemason and also his brother. Like jo I was reading that Joseph Smith was a Freemason. I know he personally was involved as a Freemason um, and I don't know particularly what, they, what their beliefs are. I officiated as a Grand Chaplain at the installation of the Nauvoo Lodge of Freemasons at the Grove near the Temple. Grand Master Jonas of Columbus being present, a large number of people assembled on the occasion. The day was exceedingly fine. All things were done in order, and universal satisfaction was manifested. In the evening, I received the first degree in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge, assembled by my general business office. I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, let's start out by just looking at the 33 degrees of Freemasonry, okay? So in Freemasonry, their little club for grown-up little boys, they give themselves all these titles and they reach these different degrees or different levels of Freemasonry. There are 33 in total. Degree number one, entered apprentice. Degree number two, fellow craft. Degree number three, master mason. Degree number four, master traveler. Degree number five, perfect master. Degree number six, master of the brazen serpent. A 19th degree, if you get into Freemasonry, when you get to the 19th degree, you will become Grand Pontiff. You know what Pontiff means? Priest. Grand Priest. Grand Pontiff. Listen to what this degree teaches. This degree proclaims the spiritual unity of all who believe in God and cherish the hope of immortality, no matter what religious leader they follow or what creed they profess. It's concerned pri primarily with the perennial conflict between light and darkness, good and evil, God and Savior. Did you hear that? The spiritual unity of all who believe in God, no matter what religious leader they follow, meaning that you could follow Buddha, you could follow Jesus, you could follow Muhammad, as long as you just believe in God. Let me tell you something. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Bible says, whosoever denieth the Son, meaning Jesus, the Son of God, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. If you're worshiping a God and you're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, is a false God. Because no man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus. And if you deny Jesus, you don't have the Father. You have another father. You have another false god. And so this teaching is an ecumenical new world order, one world government, one world religion. Let's all join together the spiritual unity of all religions. It's wicked. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. 20th degree, master ad vitam. 24th degree, brother of the forest. Brother of the forest. This degree teaches us that a mutual belief in a supreme power should bind all men together in a worldwide brotherhood. Now listen to me. I don't believe in a supreme power. I believe in Jesus. Not a supreme power, the supreme power. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus that brings salvation. And without that name, you're not even in the ballpark. But he said the universal brotherhood of all men know the Bible teaches that our brothers and sisters are those who believe in Christ. Because the Bible says that you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. If you don't believe in the name of Jesus, you're not a child of God. You become a child of God by believing in Jesus. And so we are not brothers and sisters with all human beings who just believe in a supreme being. 
That's false. Because you know who considers himself a supreme power is the devil. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And he considers himself to be the god of this world. 25th degree, master of achievement. 30th degree, grand inspector. I don't know, it's like inspector gadget or what. 31st degree, knight aspirant. 32nd degree, sublime prince of the royal secret. 33rd degree, sovereign grand inspector general. Freemasonry is a secret society where they worship Lucifer, the same god as Mormonism, because they, they're like a secret society and they worship their, who they call God, which is Lucifer. You know, in the Bible, Lucifer, right? That's who they worship. I'm pure and virtuous and wholesome and innocent. How can you say anything about, about me? Sir, you need to be born again. Is I that, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Luc say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, see the Lucifer that God created? That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. Okay. Get out of here. <clears throat> See, this is what a Mason confesses, is that Lucifer is light. How many of you knew that the Mormons were started by Joseph Smith, a Freemason? His father was a Freemason. His, his brother, Hiram, was a Freemason. It was in their family. He created a huge lodge. They had all this influence. And the, the, the rise of the Mormon church and the rise of masonry in that area, it went hand in hand. Attended the dedication of the Masonic Temple, which was attended by about 550 members of the Masonic fraternity from various parts of the world. The procession was formed at Henry Miller's house and was accompanied by the Nauvoo Brass Band to the hall. The dedicatory ceremonies were performed by the worshipful master Hiram Smith. Elder Erastus Snow delivered an able Masonic address. Dr. Goldforth and I also addressed the assembly. All the visiting Masons were furnished a dinner at the Masonic Hall at the expense of the Nauvoo Lodge. The building is admitted to be the most substantial and best finished Masonic Lodge in the Western States. Elder Amasa M. Lehman preached in the Masonic Hall. The 70s from the 1st to the 8th Quirums met in their hall. Elder Zira Pulsifer preached. Elder George A. Smith preached to the High Priests. Three persons were ordained High Priests. He, Hiram Smith, and J.C. Bennett, being High Masons, went into the house to perform some ceremonies which the others were not entitled to witness. You know, they, they also have, the Mormons actually have a series of handshakes to get into heaven. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can watch the entire ritual. I met two guys when I was working in Utah that were in Mormonism, and they, they, put, they had a lapel camera and a, cam, and a camera on their watch and a belt camera, and they went through the whole process. And they exposed it, and, and these videos are freely available on the internet showing how it's all masonry. It's the same symbols, the same terminology, the same secret words to get into the inner veil, and then you get in there and you just sit around. And this is what they teach. How do you get to heaven? You have to know a secret handshake. There are people that literally believe that. That's what they're trusting in. Well, they, they chuckle at you when you come to the door with the gospel of Jesus Christ because they think, I know the handshakes and you don't. <laughs> Right? But they don't know God. And on that day, they will regret it. Yeah, on that will, day, it right. will be sorry for them yeah. because they will go to hell. They will burn forever because they've rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. A 19th century book claims to reveal the secret handshakes. The grip of the entered apprentice is made by pressing the thumb against the top of the first the knuckle joint. The grip of the fellow craft is taken as an ordinary handshake and the mason presses the top of his thumb of against the space mason between firmly the first grasps and the right hand of the fellow mason. The thumbs of both hands are interlaced. This grip is also called the strong grip, or the lion's paw. Gives the first token of the Aaronic priesthood and asks, What is that? The first token of the Aaronic priesthood. Has it a name? 
it have. Will you give it to me? I will through the veil. The person then gives through the veil the name of his token, which is the new name received in the temple today. The Lord then gives the first token of the Melchizedek priesthood or sign of the nail and asks, What is that? The first token of the Melchizedek priesthood or sign of the nail has in the name. It has, Will you give it to me? I will through the veil. The person then gives the name of this token, which is the Son, meaning the Son of God. The Lord then gives the second token of the Melchizedek priesthood, the patriarchal grip, or sure sign of the nail, and asks, What is that? The second token of the Melchizedek priesthood, the patriarchal grip, or sure sign of the nail. Has it a name? It has. Will you give it to me? I cannot. I have not yet received it. For this purpose I have come to converse with the Lord through the veil. You shall receive it through the veil. It is received as left arms are placed upon right shoulders through the veil. The Lord then gives the name of this token and asks, What is that? The second token of the Melchizedek priesthood, the patriarchal grip, or sure sign of the nail. Has it in thee? It hath. Will you give it to me? I will through the veil. The person then repeats back to the Lord the name of this token as he received it, whereupon the Lord said, That is correct. The person is again brought to this point, and the worker gives three. And by the way, this is from LDS Living. So this is written by a Mormon. They're actually proud of this. It's called Mormons and Masons, Five Fascinating Connections by Jamie Armstrong. It says this, why did Joseph Smith become a Freemason? Because Joseph Smith was a Freemason. What is the relationship between the Masonic Lodge rites and the LDS temple ordinances? Here are five fascinating facts about the Mormons and Masons. And like I said, I'm not gonna read all of them. Let me read a few. The first five Latter-day Prophets were Freemasons. So Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilfer Woodruff, and Lorenzo Snow, the first five main leaders, main prophets of the Latter-day Saints were all Masons and all were members of the Masonic fraternity. Here's another thing that, they, that connects them. Mormonism and Masonry use several of the same symbols like the all-seeing eye, the hand clasp, holiness to the Lord, and bees. Thirdly, uh, there are similarities between the Masonic and the temple ordinances. Because the Masons, they have these like special handshakes, you know, whatever, that they do, you know, in, in secret temple rituals. Well, you know what? The Mormons have the exact same thing. They have secret handshakes. They have secret special underwear they wear that they're never supposed to take off you know, or whatever, they, they've got all sorts of weird, and it's actually, you know, Mormonism is, seems like it's just, a, you know, uh, 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 is highly connected in a spin-off of the Freemasons, which are Satan worshiping, a Satan worshiping secret society. And let me just explain something to you, you know, just real quickly. Anything that's like, a, the Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Anything that's a secret society, just mark it down, it's evil. The secret of masonry is to keep a secret. I mean, why do you have secrets? The Bible says that Jesus you know, is the light and we're meant to light the world. 
We're not meant to hide in darkness and you know try to hide what we believe or hide what we do in the temples or anything like that. But you guys do. Just like the Freemasons, they also hide everything they believe and they are a secret society just like your guys' church at the end of the day. It's exactly the same because that's what Joseph Smith taught and Brigham Young and then you guys do the same thing as the Freemasons. You can't see that there's any correlation between the two. You know, I would encourage you to actually, why don't you look up these articles? Why don't you look up what your Mormon church actually teaches and you'll find that everything I said is what they believe. And it's not what the Bible teaches. And you need to make a decision and decide, are you going to go with Joseph Smith? Or are you going to go with the Lord Jesus Christ? So, so far we've seen some pretty crazy things that the Mormons believe, but we don't have time to show you all the things. Such as baptism for the dead, the secret temple underwear that they wear, Joseph Smith being a witch, their golden plates that don't even exist, and not being able to drink hot drinks, and the four different accounts of Smith's first vision. They don't even line up, and there's just so many other things as well. And it's not Christianity at all, it's a satanic cult. And we're just going to end with some more Mormon madness. Well, obviously, the early Mormons practiced polygamy. Now, you guys, you don't do that now, do you? No. no. Yeah, because obviously Joseph Smith had multiple wives. Oh, he did, so. yes. But so, obviously, it would be okay if the government didn't condemn it, right? No, if the government didn't condemn it, I mean, we still couldn't practice it. Um, it would have to be approved. It would have to be come from the top of the church down. And uh, historically, when it was practiced in the early, uh, this dispensation, the 18, in the early 1800s, you had to, as far as I remember, you had to have, there's a few things, you had to have the financial ability to, to, to support the extra persons and families. Um, you had to have the uh, approval of the head of the church, and you had to have permission of the first wife. So that would rule out most of them. Yeah. The older you get, my wife had basically said one day, well, as long as I'm the head one, I don't care. Yeah. Someone can do the cleaning, you can do the washing, and I'll go to the movies. But the mainstream Mormon church does not represent all of those who call themselves Mormon. There are many so-called Mormon fundamentalists who also consider Joseph Smith their founding prophet, and they hold fast to his teachings, which include the requirement of polygamy to enter the celestial kingdom. The mainstream LDS church, however, has abandoned the practice of polygamy, though it still teaches that plural marriage is a principle that will be practiced in heaven. Mainstream Mormons do not consider the fundamentalists to be true Mormons because of their polygamous lifestyle. Likewise, the fundamentalist Mormons consider the mainstream LDS church to be illegitimate precisely because it abandoned the practice of plural marriage, a practice which had been established as an eternal principle and a requirement for all who would become gods in the celestial kingdom. Joseph Smith married his first wife, Emma, in 1827 in upstate New York. In the first years of their marriage, he published the Book of Mormon, founded the Mormon Church, and declared himself to be a prophet of God. By 1843, the Mormon Church was based in Nauvoo, Illinois. Around this time, and much to the dismay of his wife, Emma, Joseph wrote down a revelation that he claimed was from God, which stated that polygamy was necessary to enter eternal life and to become gods. Three early LDS leaders, each of whom were polygamists. Among them, these men had more than 100 wives. In fact, the top 15 leaders of the Mormon church at that time were polygamists. Many of their sermons and declarations are recorded in a set of volumes known as the Journal of Discourses. Included in their sermons are statements that affirm Joseph Smith's teaching about the absolute necessity of polygamy. The only men who become gods, even sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. Now, if any of you will deny the plurality of wives and continue to do so, I promise that you will be damned. Brigham Young. And Brigham Young was notorious for this. 
when they got to Salt Lake, they would go to the men and say, it's your right, it's your duty, you need to live it. They'd pressure the man to live polygamy. It was rampant in Salt Lake. This doctrine of plural marriage is one of the most important doctrines ever revealed to man in any age of the world. Without it, we never could be exalted to associate with and become gods. Apostle Joseph F. Smith. The principle of plurality of wives never will be done away with. You might as well deny Mormonism and turn away from it as to oppose the plurality of wives. Apostle Heber C. Kimball. It was called the new and everlasting covenant. And what does everlasting mean? That it should be lived forever. God the Father had a plurality of wives. Apostle Orson Pratt. It was openly taught that God and Jesus both were polygamous, not just married, but polygamous. When increasing pressure from the federal government resulted in many arrests and threats to dismantle the Mormon church's holdings, the church finally conceded and in 1890 declared that they would cease the practice of polygamy in a statement known as the Manifesto. Inasmuch as laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriage, I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws. Wilford Woodruff. And that's why the fundamentalist Mormon people broke away from the mainstream church so that they could continue living the law that they believed was given by God. The fundamentalist groups, they felt like when the church in 1890 gave up plural marriage that they were giving up the very basic foundation of their church and they were wrong. So they had to spin off from that group to keep that going. The LDS Church's abandonment of polygamy is what gave rise to Mormon fundamentalism, which continues to thrive today. Yet Section 132 still remains a part of both fundamentalist and mainstream LDS scriptures, which means that once again, there is a disparity between the mainstream Mormon Church's written doctrine and their actual practice. This puts modern-day Mormons in an awkward position. On one hand, they're taught to revere their early polygamous leaders, yet on the other, they're deeply offended by the polygamy of today's Mormon fundamentalists. Joseph Smith was a polygamist. The early leaders of the church were polygamists. The first seven LDS prophets were polygamists. All of them were breaking the law. Many were in hiding, and some were even arrested, all for their practice of polygamy. Most of the church leaders today are descendant from pioneer Mormons that all practice polygamy, but that's embarrassing for the church. I think they fear it will hurt their missionary endeavors. And the church today wants it both ways. They want to have Joseph Smith, the prophet of God, but they want the ability to reject any of his doctrines that don't fit comfortably in today's world. It seems like an odd position to me. Either he was what he claimed to be or he isn't. I don't see a middle ground here. Gordon Hinckley even had an interview where he condemned polygamy. When I hear statements like that, I just, I first of all, I just have to wonder where they're coming from. Just like they brainwash their membership, they're brainwashing the world because polygamy started with them. Joseph Smith, their prophet, said, if you don't live polygamy, you do not get exalted in heaven. The Mormons need to own up to it. Polygamy is alive and well in the United States today because of Joseph Smith. It was doctrinally driven that if any man was to reach Godhood, he had to practice polygamy. The church today denying polygamy puts them in this funny position of denying what is really their doctrine, but it's hid from the convert. The founder of Mormonism claimed polygamy as a doctrine of God. If in fact it is not a doctrine, then Joseph Smith is not a prophet of God. And my father, um, he, he got most of his lives by bribing other men with his daughters. I was one of the ones that refused to fall into that and I chose my own husband and uh, married and had a very loving relationship for 15 years. And um, until I lost them through this blood atonement process.
blood atonement teaches that there are some sins that God cannot forgive by the works of Calvary, and therefore the sinner must have his own blood spilled. This blasphemous doctrine not only diminishes the power and the purpose of Christ's blood, but glorifies the atoning power of the blood of the Mormon sinner. While steadfastly observed by Mormon fundamentalists, this anti-Christian principle originated with Joseph Smith and was furthered by later Mormon prophets. This troublesome doctrine of blood atonement blemishes the wholesome public image required by Mormonism's leaders. Today, the brethren in Salt Lake City still grapple over the predicament they find themselves in when having to both affirm and deny blood atonement. For example, the late Mormon apostle Bruce R. McConkie, in his book Mormon Doctrine, denied that the church ever practiced or taught blood atonement. Yet on the same page, stated that because the blood of Christ is not sufficient to forgive certain sins, the Mormon God requires man to have his own blood spilled. On the 27th of June, we were carrying on our life as usual, and um, happened to be the 144th anniversary of the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. My half-brothers came into our office and murdered my husband. At the same time, there were three other consecutive deaths uh, going on. My brother-in-law, Duane, and his eight-year-old daughter, Jenny, was with him, and they also killed her. Our names were on the list of uh, to be atoned for. Uh, my father uh, believed that we were traitors to God's cause and that our blood must be shed to atone for the sin of uh, turning against light knowledge, as he supposed. Blood atonement is if you have charity enough uh, for uh, someone to save them, uh, the shedding of their blood is the only way that they can atone for certain sins. People really thought they were doing a favor in my great-grandfather's day to shed the blood, save their soul, and it's still taking place today. My great-grandfather, John D. Lee, was one of the Mormon men who were called avenging angels or destroying angels. It was their duty, their obligation, to cut the throats, shed the blood of people who were apostate Mormons, who were, who were guilty of speaking against the, the authorities. Jesus shed his blood that, uh, as an infinite sacrifice, but there are some sins that the blood of Jesus cannot atone for, and there it therefore it requires the shedding of uh, that man's blood to atone. For adultery, for apostasy, for marriage to a Negro, for not receiving the gospel, for lying, or any of the other offenses, they'd have to have their own bloodshed to have forgiveness of sin. To put it simply, my father's beliefs stem directly from Mormonism. Not one, not one thing is different than what the Mormon, early Mormon doctrine is. The original doctrine that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught is exactly what I believe. I'm now at present baptizing people, and I have five apostles now, and we're out uh, teaching and, and preaching the gospel trying to get the Mormons into the original uh, doctrine that Brigham and Joseph had it set on. And I refuse to give it up. I've been cast out of the Mormon church because of it. That's the reason why today people are still killing each other, shedding the blood so they can have forgiveness of sin. And it comes directly from Joseph Smith and from Brigham Young. There's been 27 murders since uh, 1972, my uncle, my sister, my brother Arthur, my brother committed suicide, which I, is a direct consequence of all of this. I would just like uh, you to know that uh, if anything happens to me ever or to my children, I will uh, personally, uh, I believe the Mormon Church in general will be responsible because the very doctrine of blood atonement stems from Mormonism. There is not a man or woman who violates the covenants made with their God that will not be required to pay the debt. The blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it. Now take a person in this congregation who has knowledge with regard to being saved in the kingdom of our God and our Father 
and being exalted, one who knows and understands the principles of external life and sees the beauty and excellency of the eternities before him compared with the vain and foolish things of the world. And suppose that he is overtaken in a gross fault, that he has committed a sin that he knows will deprive him of that exaltation which he desires, and that he cannot attain to it without the shedding of his blood, and also knows that by having his blood shed, he will atone for that sin and be saved and exalted with the gods. Suppose you found your brother in bed with your wife and put a javelin through both of them. You would be justified and they would atone for their sins and be received into the kingdom of God. I would at once do so in such a case and under such circumstances I have no wife whom I love so well that I would not put a javelin through her heart and I would do it with clean hands. This is our loving neighbor as ourselves. If he needs help, help him. And if he wants salvation and it is necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he may be saved, spill it. Any of you who understand the principles of eternity, if you have sinned a sin requiring the shedding of blood, accept the sin unto death, would not be satisfied nor rest until your blood should be spilled, that you might gain that salvation you desire. That is the way to love mankind. President Brigham Young We may talk of men being redeemed by the efficacy of his blood, but the truth is that that blood has no efficacy to wash away our sins. That must depend on our own action. Elder Amesa M. Lyman. But even earlier than that, I had, President Hinckley had given us this challenge in 2005 to read the Book of Mormon by the end of the year. And so I took that challenge and got through it in my regular Book of Mormon. And so I, so I decided to read it again in this little brown 1830. And it is available like a desert book or something. And mm -hmm. I think it's around. And that's really where the differences started happening. And so, well, well and, and so then these changes in the Book of Mormon that surfaced as I started reading through the 1830 uh, kind of illustrate even more that maybe this was the kind of thinking that Joseph Smith had back in, in the 1829, 1830 time frame. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a few of these for, for the mm -hmm. audience as mm -hmm. well. The first one is in First Nephi, chapter 11, verse 18, 25. It says, Behold, the virgin which thou seest is the mother of God, after the manner of the flesh. Today, that same scripture reads that, Behold, the virgin is the mother of the Son of God, instead of mother of God. And there's a huge difference, doctrinal difference in that. Yeah, I'd say that's a huge doctrinal difference. But it's repeated a couple of more times in First Nephi chapter 11, 21. It says, Behold the Lamb of God, even the Eternal Father. Today, it's been changed to read, Yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. Hmm. In 1 Nephi 11:32, it says, And I looked and beheld the Lamb of God, that he was taken by the people. Yea, the everlasting God was judged of the world. And now it says, Yea, the Son of the everlasting God was, changed, was judged of the world. And then the last one here is in 1 uh, Nephi, uh, it's uh, 1340, it says, These last records shall make known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world. Mm -hmm. And today it reads, These last records shall make known to all kindreds and tongues and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world. Now I realize this isn't quite true Christianity as you're, as you're saying because it's, uh, is that somewhat called modalism uh, yeah, or something? It, true, but it certainly isn't Mormonism. It isn't Mormonism. And so it, the doctrine was changed mm -hmm. and the Book of Mormon was changed to, uh, I guess, make it more, more agreeable to what current Mormon mm -hmm. doctrine is. Do you have any idea who made the changes and when Joseph they were Smith made? Joseph Smith changed them probably about between 1835, 1838. Um, it was in 1838 that we have the Pearl of Great Price version of his first vision mm -hmm. where he said he saw, the, saw God the Father and Jesus Christ in 1838. 
38. So I think, I think the consensus is, and I probably should have checked that more carefully, exactly when he made the changes, but it was somewhere between that uh, later 1830 time frame. So while you were reading the Book of Mormon, uh, according to what uh, Mr. Hinckley wanted, you know, suggested That's that you do, do yeah. these stuck out and jumped well, out of the page at you while yeah, you were had, doing the reading? I had just that? read, you know, the regular Book of Mormon, and mm -hmm. so to, to read that it, that he was, uh, that Jesus was the everlasting Father did stand out. Yeah. And it was in First Nephi, so it's, mm -hmm. you know, you get through First Nephi, you read that quite a bit. Right. Uh, everybody right. starts the Book of Mormon over and over again. and He's not talking about the biblical version of the Trinity, but it certainly isn't the Mormon doctrine well, of it, three gods in and, the Godhead. And see, the th interesting thing is, Doris, you'd have to understand, being an LDS person uh, for all my life, all these many years, I actually wasn't looking to challenge my testimony of the gospel or mm -hmm. the, the Mormon mm -hmm. church. I had no idea that I was moving eventually to a Christian look at things. Mm -hmm. So my whole concept, this was just mind-boggling for me. I didn't realize that it wasn't Mormon and it maybe wasn't true Christianity either. It was what they now call modalism or some other yeah, kind of a concept yeah. of God. The only thing I knew is that I had been raised and taught that the Book of Mormon was the Word of God, word for word, uh -huh. that it was trustworthy, and uh, that he had translated it by the power of God, and that he had um, couldn't move from one word to the next word or phrase until it got it was, it was right, perfect. and then he could move on. Yeah. That's what I'd always been taught. So to read these conflicts and these problems just turn my life upside down. Yeah, I, just, it, it I was is. having a hard time deal, dealing with them. And the thing is, is again, back to the logical look at it, it's not, it's not open to interpretation. I mean, it, it, the Book of Mormon got changed. Mm -hmm, it did. <laughs> yeah. I became more and more convinced that Joseph Smith was not telling the truth. About 1820, the Book of Mormon got changed so that it made things more clear. Mm -hmm. um, I just couldn't trust it anymore. Uh, and the whole issue with the Book of Mormon is that it is supposed to be the, the most perfect book that had ever been yeah. given to man, and that you would get closer to God than any other book on the planet if yeah. you would read it, and yet it's filled with thousands of changes. Some of them are, are just punctuation and, and yeah. grammar, but still, God, doesn't God have good grammar? Well, I always thought it was... UTLM.org has identified like 3,900 changes in the Book of Mormon, and a lot of them, as you say, are punctuation. And I was always willing to give the, the printer's problems or anything else that kind of benefit, you know, the benefit of the doubt, is, are, was, were, which, and who, and those kinds of grammatical, and that probably mm -hmm. makes up most of the 3,900. Mm -hmm. But there were some serious doctrinal changes there, that occurred. Well, so, therefore, their founding prophet, Joseph Smith, he wrote this fraudulent document called the Book of Abraham, okay? <laughs> now, this fraudulent document, the Book of Abraham, is found in modern-day Mormon scriptures because they have a scripture called the Pearl of Great Price. Who's ever heard of that? <laughs> so in this modern Mormon scripture, the Pearl of Great Price, there's a chapter or a section called the Book of Abraham. Now, this is where the Book of Abraham came from. This guy was traveling through America selling ancient Egyptian artifacts. He's just kind of a junk dealer or a, a guy who's just trying to rip people off and sell people old stuff and tell them that it's this really cool stuff or whatever. So he sells Joseph Smith just some random parchment or whatever it was, papyrus. I don't remember the details of it, but it was some kind of a document with just some random hieroglyphics on it. Now, this is before hieroglyphics had been deciphered. This is before the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, which allowed Egyptologists to be able to decipher hieroglyphics. So he gets this hieroglyphic document and he just makes up what it says. So he says, oh, I'm gonna translate this. So he translates this random document and says, it's the book of Abraham. Well, it turns out that the Rosetta Stone is discovered. They end up deciphering it and it was just some random Egyptian dude's last will and testament where he's just giving stuff to his kids and had nothing to do with Abraham whatsoever. <laughs> and this is why people are leaving the Mormon church by the droves every day because anybody with an internet connection can figure out that Mormonism is a fraud in about five or 10 minutes. Right. 
That's why they have to tell their people, don't go on the internet. But anyway, you know, they basically are leaving by the droves because you can just look at the book of Abraham. You can look at the facsimile of what Joseph Smith supposedly translated. You can decipher it. It's got nothing to do with Abraham. It's a fraud. And there's so many things like that. The sad thing is, though, that they're not leaving the Mormon church and becoming Bible-believing Christians. They're mainly becoming agnostics and atheists. So getting them saved is a real challenge. Getting them to leave the Mormon church isn't as hard because they just need to see a few of these basic pieces of evidence. My family has been raised in the Mormon church. Not all of the, mem not all of the, not all of the family members have stayed in the church. Uh, there's no force to keep members in the church. They have their own, we believe that people have their own agency to choose. And so it's up to people to make their own choose and you don't, you don't get your, those children that make different decisions to you. You don't sort of criticize them over it. That's up to them to make their own call on it. Hey, this is Pastor Logan Robertson from Pillar Baptist Church in Australia. I'd just like to thank you for watching this documentary about the Mormons and how that what they believe does not line up with the Word of God. The Book of Mormon teaches a lot of strange doctrines and teaches that you have to do good works to get to heaven. Now, if you had to do good works to get to heaven, none of us would be saved because none of us are good enough. Because in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible reads, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it says that everyone in the world is a sinner. I've sinned, you've sinned, the whole world has sinned. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. And so just like when we work a job, we get paid wages and we get paid money, well, the payment or the wage for our sin, according to the Bible, is death. And everyone deserves to die because of their sins, the Bible says. And once we die, there's a second death. The Bible talks about it in Revelation. It says that there's a second death. It's like a spiritual death that we die. We die a physical death, then a spiritual death. In Revelation chapter 21, verse number 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so the second death is where we get placed after we die if we have committed sin. And it lists the sins that we've committed will send us to hell. It says that the liars are going to hell. It says murderers are going to hell. And it says the fearful are going to hell. So it doesn't matter what we've done, whether we've murdered or we've lied, we're going to go to hell because of our sins. We have to pay for our sins. Now, that sounds like bad news, and it is, because everyone's going to go to hell because of their sin. But the word gospel in the Bible simply means the good news. And the good news is found in Romans chapter 8, 5, verse 8. The Bible reads, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the good news is that we don't have to pay for our sins in hell. We can go to heaven, and it says the way to get to heaven is by Jesus Christ. Because you have to understand that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ himself came from heaven, he became flesh, and he lived a sinless life that we cannot do. Because we, I can't live a sinless life, neither can you. And Jesus Christ lived that sinless life that we can't do because He was 100% man, but He was 100% God as well. We believe in the Trinity. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, that there's three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So there's one God but it's made up of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We have to believe that there's one God, not thousands of gods like the Mormons believe. And so Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, He lived a sinless life, He did a lot of miracles, He raised people from the dead, and at the end of His life, the Bible says that He was rejected by the people that He came to save. It says He came unto His own, but His own received Him not. 
And once they arrest him, they spat upon him, they bit him up, they whipped him 39 times on his back, they put that crown of thorns and crushed that upon his head, and they mocked the King of Kings, they mocked the Lord of Lords, they put on a royal garments upon him, and they were mocking him, and they made him carry his own cross to Calvary. And once he was nailed on the cross, it was like all the sins I've done were placed upon Jesus. All the sins you have done were placed upon Jesus like he had done them. The Bible says that his body was buried in the tomb and his soul descended to hell for three days and three nights. Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 12, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But after three days and three nights, he rose again from the dead, conquering sin, conquering death, proven that he was God in the flesh. And he left our sins in hell so that we do not have to pay for them. And he died for everyone in the world. The Bible says that he's a propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it doesn't matter what color you are. God doesn't care whether you come from China or Africa or America or England or Russia, South America, Australia, it doesn't matter where you're from, God loves you, it doesn't matter what color skin you got, because the Bible says we all come from one blood. We've all got red blood, and He died for you, He died for me, He died for the whole world. But there's one thing that you have to do to be saved. It says in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse number 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Which is a great question, what must I do? And they said in verse number 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Thy house just means that if your household believes on Jesus, that thou will be saved as well. But notice it says how to be saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say believe and go to the Mormon church. It doesn't say believe and go to the temple. It doesn't say believe and put on strange underwear or repent of your sins or be baptized or be baptized for the dead or do good works. It says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The most famous verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, that means anybody, believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So once you believe on Christ, you get everlasting life according to the Bible. Now, the word believe, it's like our word faith. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the Bible compares faith with belief because they mean the same thing. Another word that we would use would be the word trust. Because if I was going to jump out of an aeroplane, I had a parachute on, I believe that parachute's going to open. But after I jump out, what am I doing? I'm trusting that parachute from phys for me that I don't physically die when I hit the ground. That's what we're doing with Jesus. We're putting our faith on Him. We're trusting in Him that He paid for our sins on the cross, was buried, and then He rose again from the dead. What we're doing is we're relying on Him, not relying on ourselves. What we're doing is we're dependent on Him, not dependent on ourselves to get to heaven and our good works or our way of life or anything like that. It's just by trusting in Jesus that we're saved. And the Bible actually says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So once we're saved, the Bible says that we get everlasting life. The moment we believe, we get born again, we have everlasting life. Now, everlasting means it lasts forever. It will never end. Now, if Jesus took that off you for any reason, then it was never everlasting. But we know it says in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world begun. So Jesus promised us everlasting life, and it says that God that cannot lie. So God's not going to lie to you in John chapter 3, verse 16. When He say you get everlasting life, that's what He means. It's everlasting. He can never take it off you. It says in Romans chapter 6 that it was a gift from God. God is the one that paid for that gift. Just like when I was a kid and I got birthday presents, Christmas presents from my parents, they paid for them. They worked for that money and brought me a gift. Same with thing with the gift of eternal life. God 
went out and he came to earth as a man. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross and he shed his blood for the gift of everlasting life. Once you receive that, you can never lose it. The Bible says that you become a son of God. Now, it doesn't say that you'll become a God like the Mormons teach, but it says you will become a son of God or you'll become a child or a daughter of God. And just like I've got five children, no matter what they do, they'll always be my children. Even if they grew up and said something very bad or they did bad things, they're still my children. Just the same with us and God. Once we're his child, we're always his child. I would never, you know, put my son in a bonfire to discipline him. Same with God. He's not going to put us in hell, which is a big bonfire, to punish us. The Bible says that he will punish us on this earth, but it, it does, he's never going to send us to hell because we've got everlasting life. No matter what we do, we are saved and everlasting means forever. And so I'm praying that you believed what I just told you from the Bible. Don't believe it just because I said it. Believe it because it's from the Word of God. And if you truly believe that, if you believe you've sinned before, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you believe He was buried and that He rose again, and you believe that He gives you everlasting life and is the only one God, and Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, you can be saved today just by simply trusting that. If you believe that, we're just going to word a quick prayer and you can just repeat after me. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we just have to ask for that gift. Now if you don't believe that, don't pray. Because it doesn't, just asking for a gift if you don't believe it, that doesn't mean that you will receive it. You have to trust in Jesus put all your faith on Him, and then ask for that gift. If you truly believe it, we'll just say a quick prayer right now. Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned, but I'm trusting you. I believe you died and rose again. Please save me now and take me to heaven when I die. I'm only trusting you, Jesus. Amen. So thank you for watching and have a good day. Secret, right? It's not secret. It's sac sacred. Oh, sacred, yeah. Oh, okay, it's totally different, right? Yeah. If you if you join the church, yeah. you get baptized. Yeah. After one year, become an elder, then you're allowed to go in there if you oh. have a temple recommend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
we've been trying to get interviews, there's don't want to talk to us, they keep lying to us. So we're just going to rock in because the, the, the sign at the start said, visitors welcome. You believe that you can become a god, right? Can you become a god or not? Well, we're all trying to progress towards that, aren't we? How becoming become more like a heavenly father. How do you become a god? Uh, by doing the best that we can. The Church of the Latter Day Satan's. Oh, we, we believe in in Satan. I mean, he's. <laughs> Because she's our brother. Yeah.